Let's start this overview of the game Inori with an apology to artist Susan Demontrand, because she does fantastic work on this box that looks like nothing else on the shelves. It feels like a very real world with lots of interesting characters and environments. There's details on all sides of the box. The game board looks great. Again, unlike anything else out there, the cards have fantastic imagery as well. And yet, once I start talking about this game from Matthew Aubert, Theo Riviere, and Space Cowboys, I will probably mention none of it because I'll just start talking about colors and that's it. Everything else, the clans, the spirits, the world of the game goes away from me. It's there. It looks great, but the gameplay for me boils down to colors and tokens and points. Here's how it works. Here's the starting setup for a four player game of Inori with each player starting with three tokens in their player color. They'll get more tokens as the game progresses. The game lasts four rounds with the first round having only three cards in play and then you'll have four, five, and six. And when you get to this round, you get your new token. With a two player or three player setup, you have a different arrangement of tokens. You also have different starting cards. There are two starting cards for each player count. And for the two and three player accounts, you will have cards with only three spaces available so that you can make the game work. Technically, these are called offering markers because you are visiting the spirits, you're offering them something, and in return, they are often giving you favors or runes. Favors come in six colors. Okay, you are going to use those colors and then be rewarded by the spirits for showing what you've done in the past the favor that you have acquired from them, and you'll score points and try to get the most points and win. On a turn, you are going to place a token onto an available space, that is a space that has no one on it, and typically you will get something from going to that space. Sometimes there's a cost, sometimes there's an additional action. Usually it's very straightforward. If I go here, I get two purple favor. I just put them in front of me, and that's that. So get two blue, get two green, get a rune tile. Rune tiles come in three types. We'll talk about those later. If you go here, that doesn't really make sense because you are getting a green favor and then you are scoring points equal to the number of yellow that you have. You start with nothing, so you probably don't wanna go there, but maybe you wanna go here first, get two yellow, and plan to go here in the future. Now, someone might stop you by blocking that space so that you don't score any points, but they're probably just hurting themselves in the process. They can go down here and get these tokens. These three colors match the color on the bottom of the card here. We'll talk about why in a moment, but take these, put them in front of you. And you will do this with all three of your tokens. Now, when you go here onto these spaces, you get an action and the color is determined only when you first go to one of those spaces. For example, if I go here, I pick one of the six colors available, place it down here, and now I get three red tokens. Put those in front of me. And now for the rest of the game, you go to that space, you're gonna get three red tokens. If you go here, for example, you will get a rune and you will get a token of that color. Let's say we do green. Brown's really into runes for some reason. If we go here, you get points equal to the color that you put here. So I could put yellow. I already have two yellow. I get two points. Okay. These colors will get locked in over the course of the game. And it's very important because you're also setting up end game scoring for each of those colors. So if we end with something like this, then at the end of the game, whoever has the most blue tokens will get 10 points and second most will get five. Green, six and three, yellow, four and two, and so on. Red is worth nothing because it's in this low spot. Gray is worth nothing because it was never put on the board. When you go to one of these spaces up here, you must pay the cost of the color that you put here. So the black player could go here, put gray on the board. They can pay a gray. That's the only color they have because this is the action they took previously. They pay that and now they get two favor of any color. Maybe they just wanna go harder into gray because gray is worth 10 points at game's end. Maybe they got other things they wanna do, right? Maybe they want a variety of things. 
I'll talk about why. And you keep going. Let's say white goes here, they get a purple. I really like the purple. And they get these two. They go here. And brown gets something, and yellow gets something. Right here, two more points and a green. And black goes here because now you get a gray and you get points equal to the number of different colors you have. So black gets three points. Okay. At the end of the round, after all the markers, all the tokens have been placed, you are going to resolve the cards. These tokens just come back. You resolve the cards. If all the spots on a card are full, then players score points equal to the number of favor they have of this color. So the neutral, well, they just go back. White actually has no green. Poor choice, white. You went here and then never followed through getting green. Black has got one green, gets one more point. And you will now go to a green card. If you have not completed all the spaces, no one scores anything, right? This would score yellow if you complete this card, but you didn't. So you will now go to purple. So all of these colors are paired and they will be continuous over the source of the game. You, you flip the course of the game. You flip over a purple, you're gonna to go to purple or yellow, just as you did here. All right. You didn't complete this, so we'll go to blue. So you know as you're placing tokens down what you're going to score for at the end, where you will go in the world if you don't fill this card, and you can plan for the future or you can plan for the present and what's to come as well. At the end of the round, the player with the lowest score, and if there's a tie you just choose someone at random, will draw two of these cards. and choose one of them to go in this new spot. These cards do not follow the color mix. Here we've got red and gray and gray and purple. They choose one of their choice. Let's say the white player goes here and they choose this one. The other card is thrown away. And the next round, that's how these cards will come into play as well. So whoever is last gets to set up this and ideally, of course, make it work for them. You'll now play an additional round. Now some cards will have cost. You go here, you pay a red, and you get two favor of any color. You go here, you score points equal to whatever color you have the most of. If there's a tie, you choose that. And again, you'll score for red. Additionally, with the new start cards for the round, you will also score for this color if you don't go there. So gives an incentive for players one way or the other. Do you care? Black does not want this card to be filled. Tan and brown right now don't care. They have none of those colors. White definitely wants this to be full, but they can't do it on their own because they have only three tokens. They'd have to go there and then go there and then take the neutral. And that's all they're doing the whole time. They probably want that one. And that's all they do. Ideally, you want to partner up with people to make things happen or sort of work with people to not make things happen, avoiding spaces if someone is Shooting out with a lot of blue, maybe you just avoid this completely. It's on them if they want to make that happen and have blue score. Other symbols that have come up, you pay blue. Again, points equal to the color you have the most of. Here you get two favor of the color you have the fewest of. And if there's a tie, you choose. These are all straightforward now. You score purple, and then if this card is full, you will score purple. Here, pay it favor of the color you have the most of, again, choose if you have a tie, get three gray. Pay a purple, score equal to the number of different colors you have. These spots are not refilled. It's a one-time boost. If you're going to a particular color, you can set up ahead of time. And that matters mostly after you've played the game a couple of times. I've played four times now on a review, uh, on a copy in the BGG library that Asmodee gave to us at Gen Con 2024. And you start to understand what the colors are going to do. So you look at the purple cards. All of the purple cards are going to score purple. And then they will score again if purple is filled. So once you start down this purple path, other people are going to see that. They possibly compete for purple as well. Or you have multiple people getting into purple to continually try to put purple on the board and score it. 
That's a lot of time saying purple. Now, purple is paired with yellow. You go with yellow and you have the similar situation. Yellow is going to score as a space. Yellow will score again if it's filled. So you start learning the characteristics of the colors and then that will affect earlier actions. So in the first game, you play kind of random. And then after that, you start to get an idea of what's going on. Red has red cost on every card. And that red cost gets you to favor of the color of your choice. So you score red if it's filled, but you have to spend red in order to get something else. You can, of course, just get more red but you're probably doing other things too to shoot for these bonuses or pay other cost or score points. Green, you're scoring for variety in addition to green. Gray, you got lots of runes. So what do the runes do? Let's talk about those. Runes come in three types. For each color, there is a rune that depicts two favor, and you can reveal this at any time. If we were going to score red, right, because red is filled and white is on there, you won't score for this only if you have a token on the card. White could reveal two red and add it to their score, and now they're going to score additional points. These two count for the rest of the game for the thing they have the most of. So if I end up Again, pretend these are red. I have five red. I would go to a space like this. I score five points if that's the color I have the most of. Here again. So those count for the rest of the game once you reveal them. This rune, there's three of those. You can go to a space that's already occupied. At the start of your turn, you reveal that, you go somewhere. So you can't necessarily be blocked. You can't use a thing twice, but if you get a rune, then you can use it to go somewhere. And for each color, there's one of these where you can move someone off a card of a color or move them to a card of the color. So if the black player is going last in the round, they've already done this. For their final turn, they could reveal this, pick up this token and move it over there. This player doesn't get anything, but now this card is filled and blue will score because it is filled and will go to a blue card next. What do the blue cards have, by the way? Didn't show those. Getting tokens you had the fewest of. So helping you diversify. So one of each of these in each color in here. You're going to do this four times, again, you will get more tokens and that helps you fill up more spaces, but not all of the spaces, right? You will have some level of competition. Again, let's say we go to gray, we go to purple again, we go to red, here we go to red. Let's say we filled up all that and we'll pretend this is a new one. So now we have an additional token, but there's still collectively only 16 tokens to go to all of these spaces. So again, some will be filled, some will not. And the whole time you're doing things, you're trying to score points based on the colors that you're filling, based on the favor that you have, but you're also keeping an eye on the end game because this is a lot of points. We've had winning scores generally in this range, right? So 60, you get 20 points here from majorities at the end. That's a third of your score. And really swing you up high. Did I explain all these? Here you go. Again, you have to have a cost, pay that token, get five points. So each round you can go there, spend five, uh, spend one, get five points. Are you still going to get the majority? Maybe not, but maybe it's worth it if you get five each time. Although the majority happens without you spending an action to make that happen. You play four rounds and whoever has the most points wins. As I mentioned, I played Inori four times on a copy borrowed from the BGG library, and that copy will be back in the library at BGGCon in November if you happen to go there. You can check out my bagging skills because I know how to bag when I have to. I played the game with two, three, and four players, and the starting conditions vary a little, but with two players, the more important thing is you get more tokens as the game progresses. You'll end up with seven tokens in the final round, and that is essential because 
Often, if you want to score something, you have to do it yourself because if you're going to profit more than your opponent, they don't want to help you do that unless there's something critical for them that they are trying to do on some other card. The majorities are harsher in a two-player game. Only the player with the most tokens scores. Second player gets nothing because otherwise it's not as important as it would be. With more players, there's more of a collaborative feeling where often you partner with someone else to make things happen. Those tokens that you start with, the two tokens in each of the three colors at the beginning of the game, those go away and are not replenished, so those spaces die off, which shifts more action elsewhere once those are claimed. And the colors get locked in at different times depending upon how quickly a player wants to devote themselves to a particular color. Do you want to lock in green at 10 points and put the focus on that or shift around and sort of invest in a few colors and see where things go? So it is interesting that you get to determine the value of those colors at the end of the game for everyone. But once it's done, it's done and you got to work with it from there. Now, I played four times, as I mentioned. The first time was rather confusing because I didn't get a good sense of where anything was leading to. You're doing this, but why? You're getting this for what? But once you've played the complete game and you see the arc of it and how the different color worlds come in and have different abilities to them and sort of different focus, you get a little clearer picture, especially because the top part scores, the bottom part does not score. And so you're working towards that, but also trying to work against the opponent to lead things in the direction you want. Four player game worked great. Three player game worked well, except in the final round, we all just devolved into going wherever gave you the most points because we had an incredibly purple heavy world. Like the two opponents were both big in the purple, we had a purple card, purple card, another purple card, no, green card at the end that was also just scoring points, right? Score for gray, score for red, score for blue, score for the number of different colors you have, and then at the end, score for green, score for yellow. So this was just all scoring and not all of the cards are like that. So the end round of that three player game it was kind of a downer because it was very much just go where you're going to get the most points and then do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again, score majorities. So that was less interesting. And I think it worked out because of the final card we pulled and because we were all heavily into purple. Those two kept making purple happen and then score again for purple. Yeah, that's that drove the game. So you can have different feelings on the game depending upon what's coming up and how people partner together. So that's good, right? Your actions matter and the other person's matter and they intertwine to determine where the world evolves from there. The runes are a dicey thing, as you might imagine. You're drawing something at random. We've had two games in which someone drew one of the runes that lets you move someone to or from a, a card of that color. And that color was not in the game ever because we went in a different direction and it just never came back because there's always a red and blue card. There's always purple and yellow. There's always green and gray, but it doesn't mean that a color is coming back. And so you might get a rune that does nothing or a rune that lets you go where someone is. And that's something you never have to worry about. Really, the valuable ones are the ones that depict two tokens because it can be an in-game surprise when you're going for a majority, suddenly you're on top. Ties are friendly, so if you tie for first, you both get that big number and no one gets the second one. So you can go that route if you want. It's available to you or you just ignore runes and don't even think about them and just keep track of everything while of course being aware that other people might do that and spoil your majority. So the game works incredibly smoothly. It just has that one game learning curve where it feels arbitrary. I'm doing something to pick up tokens and it is a resource management game at heart. Yes, you're going somewhere, you're picking up tokens, you're then spending those tokens to do something or just scoring for the tokens and they don't go away when you score. So you want to hit it again, 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 
but you have to work to make that happen. And while you're doing that, you're often taking actions that get you other tokens that might pull you in slightly different directions. So you're trying to manage that flow of what you're getting along with the balance of what everyone else is doing in order to end up on top. The main advice I'd give if you are playing, do not ignore the end game majority bonus because that has proved critical in every game. You need that. So determining those colors and what's going to score at which levels is critical. Don't ignore that. Beyond that, maybe you will appreciate the art more than I do because it looks great, but I only look at it before and after I play. During the game, it's just heads down, focus on colors. That's it. Everything else dissolves.